Book 18, Chapter 12, The History of Tom Jones, A Foundling, by Henry Fielding. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, go to LibriVox.org. Recording by Maureen Blasky. The History of Tom Jones, A Foundling, by Henry Fielding. Book 18, Chapter 12 Approaching Still Nearer to the End Jones, being now completely dressed, attended his uncle to Mr. Western's. He was indeed one of the finest figures ever beheld, and his person alone would have charmed the greater part of womankind, but we hope it hath already appeared in this history that nature, when she formed him, did not totally rely, as she sometimes doth, on this merit only to recommend her work. Sophia, who angry as she was, was likewise set forth to the best advantage, for which I leave my female readers to account, appeared so extremely beautiful, that even Allworthy, when he saw her, could not forbear whispering Western that he believed she was the finest creature in the world. To which Western answered in a whisper, overheard by all present, so much the better for Tom, for damn me if she shan't have the tossling her. Sophia was all over scarlet at these words, while Tom's countenance was altogether as pale, and he was almost ready to sink from his chair. The tea-table was scarce removed before Western lugged Allworthy out of the room, telling him he had business of consequence to impart, and must speak to him that instant in private before he forgot it. The lovers were now alone, and it will, I question not, appear strange to many readers, that those who had so much to say to one another, when danger and difficulty attended their conversation, and who seemed so eager to rush into each other's arms when so many bars lay in their way, now that with safety they were at liberty to say or do whatever they pleased, should both remain for some time silent and motionless, insomuch that a stranger of moderate sagacity might have well concluded they were mutually indifferent. But so it was, however strange it may seem, both sat with their eyes cast downwards on the ground, and for some minutes continued in perfect silence. Mr. Jones, during this interval, attempted once or twice to speak, but was absolutely incapable, muttering only, or rather sighing out some broken words, when Sophia at length, partly out of pity to him, and partly to turn the discourse from the subject which she knew well enough he was endeavouring to open, said, "'Sure, sir, you are the most fortunate man in the world in this discovery. "'And can you really, madam, think me so fortunate?' said Jones, sighing. "'Will I have incurred your displeasure?' "'Nay, sir,' said she, "'as to that you best know whether you have deserved it.' "'Indeed, madam,' answered he, "'you yourself are as well apprised of all my demerits. "'Mrs. Miller hath acquainted you with the whole truth.' Oh, my Sophia, am I never to hope for forgiveness? I think, Mr. Jones, said she, I may almost depend on your own justice, and leave it to yourself to pass sentence on your own conduct. Alas, answered he, it is mercy, and not justice, which I implore at your hands. Justice, I know, must condemn me, yet not for the letter I sent to Lady Belliston. Of that I most solemnly declare you have had a true account. He then insisted much on the security given him by Nightingale of a fair pretense of breaking off, if, contrary to their expectations, her ladyship should have accepted his offer, but confessed that he had been guilty of a great indiscretion to put such a letter as that into her power, which, said he, I have dearly paid for in the effect it has upon you. I do not, I cannot, says she, believe otherwise of that letter than you would have me. My conduct, I think, shows you clearly I do not believe there is much in that. 
and yet mr jones have i not enough to resent after what passed at upton so soon to engage in a new amour with another woman while i fancied and you pretended your heart was bleeding for me indeed you have acted strangely can i believe the passion you have professed to me to be sincere or if i can what happiness can i assure myself of with a man capable of so much inconstancy o oh, my sophia cries he do not doubt the sincerity of the purest passion that ever inflamed a human breast think most adorable creature of my unhappy situation of my despair could i my sophia have flattered myself with the most distant hopes of ever being permitted to throw myself at your feet in the manner i do now it would not have been in the power of any other woman to have inspired a thought which the severest chastity could have condemned inconstancy to you oh, sophia if you can have goodness enough to pardon what is past do not let any cruel future apprehensions shut your mercy against me no repentance was ever more sincere oh let it reconcile me to my heaven in this dear bosom sincere repentance mr jones answered she will obtain the pardon of a sinner but it is from one who is a perfect judge of that sincerity a human mind may be imposed on nor is there any infallible method to prevent it you must expect however that if i can be prevailed on by your repentance to pardon you i will at least insist on the strongest proof of its sincerity name any proof in my power answered jones eagerly time replied she time alone mr jones can convince me that you are a true penitent and have resolved to abandon these vicious courses which i should detest you for if i imagined you capable of persevering in them do not imagine it cries jones on my knees i entreat i implore your confidence a confidence which it shall be the business of my life to deserve let it then said she be the business of some part of your life to show me you deserve it i think i have been explicit enough in assuring you that when i see you merit my confidence you will obtain it after what has passed sir can you expect i should take you upon your word he replied do not believe me upon my word i have a better security a pledge for my constancy which it is impossible to see and to doubt what is that said sophia a little surprised i will show you my charming angel cried jones seizing her hand and carrying her to the glass there behold it there in that lovely figure that face that shape those eyes the mind which shines through these eyes can the man who shall be in possession of these be inconstant impossible my sophia they would fix a dormant a lord rochester you could not doubt it if you could see with any eyes but your own sophia blushed and half smiled but forcing again her brow into a frown if i am to judge said she of the future by the past my image will no more remain in your heart when i am out of your sight than it will in this glass when i am out of the room by heaven by all that is sacred said jones it never was out of my heart the delicacy of your sex cannot conceive the grossness of ours nor how little one sort of amour has to do with the heart i will never marry a man replied sophia very gravely who shall not learn refinement enough to be as incapable as i am of making such a distinction i will learn it said jones i have learnt it already the first moment of hope that my sophia might be my wife taught it me at once and all the rest of her sex from that moment became as little the objects of desire to my sense as of passion to my heart well says sophia the proof of this must be from time 
your situation mr jones is now altered and i assure you i have great satisfaction in the alteration you will now want no opportunity of being near me and convincing me that your mind is altered too oh my angel cries jones how shall i thank thy goodness and are you so good to own that you have a satisfaction in my prosperity believe me believe me madam it is you alone have given relish to that prosperity since i owe it to the dear hope oh my sophia let it not be a distant one i will be all obedience to your commands i will not dare to press anything further than you permit me yet let me entreat you to appoint a short trial oh tell me when i may expect you will be convinced of what is most solemnly true when i have gone voluntarily thus far mr jones i expect not to be pressed nay i will not oh don't look unkindly thus my sophia cries he i do not i dare not press you yet permit me at least once more to beg you would fix the period Oh, consider the impatience of love. A twelve-month, perhaps, said she. Oh, my Sophia, cries he, you have named an eternity. Perhaps it may be something sooner, says she. I will not be teased. If your passion for me be what I would have it, I think you may now be easy. Easy, Sophia? Call not such an exalting happiness as mine by so cold a name. O oh, transporting thought, am I not assured that the blessed day will come when I shall call you mine, when fear shall be no more, when I shall have that dear, that vast, that exquisite, ecstatic delight of making my Sophia happy? Indeed, sir, said she, that day is in your power oh my dear my divine angel cried he these words have made me mad with joy but i must i will thank those dear lips which have so sweetly pronounced my bliss he then caught her in his arms and kissed her with an ardour he had never ventured before at this instant western who had stood some time listening burst into the room and with his hunting voice and phrase cried out to her boy to her go to her that's it little honeys oh that's it well what is it all over hath she appointed the day boy what shall it be to-morrow or next day it shan't be put off a minute longer than next day i am resolved let me beseech you sir says jones don't let me be the occasion beseech mine cries western i thought thou hast been a lad of higher metal than to give way to a parcel of maidenish tricks i tell thee tis all flimflam the dukers she'd have the wedding to-night with all her heart wouldst not sophie come confess and be an honest girl for once what art dumb why dost not speak why should i confess sir says sophia since it seems you are so well acquainted with my thoughts that's a good girl cries he and dost consent then no indeed sir says sophia i have given no such consent and wouldn't not hae then to-morrow nor next day says western indeed sir says she i have no such intention but i can tell thee replied he why thou hast not only because thou dost love to be disobedient and to plague and vex thy father pray sir said jones interfering i tell thee thou art a puppy cries he when i forbid her then it was all nothing but sighing and whining and languishing and writing now i am for thee she is against thee all the spirit of contrary that's all she is above being guided and governed by her father that is the whole truth on it it is only to disoblige and contradict me what would my papa have me do cries sophia what would i a thee do says he why gin i am this moment well sir says sophia i will obey you there is my hand mr jones well 
"'And will you consent to aye unto morrow morning?' says Western. "'I will be obedient to you, sir,' cries she. "'Why, then, to-morrow morning be the day,' cries he. "'Why, then, to-morrow morning shall be the day, papa, since you will have it so,' says Sophia. Jones then fell upon his knees and kissed her hand in an agony of joy, while Western began to caper and dance about the room, presently crying out, "'Where the devil is Allworthy? He is without now, a-talking with that damned lawyer Dowling, when he should be minding other matters.' He then sailed out in quest of him, and very opportunely left the lovers to enjoy a few tender minutes alone. But he soon returned with Allworthy, saying, "'If you won't believe me, you may ask her yourself. Hast not gin thy cassette, Sophie, to be married to-morrow?' "'Such are your commands, sir,' cries Sophia. "'And I dare not be guilty of disobedience.' "'I hope, madam,' cries Allworthy, "'my nephew will merit so much goodness, "'and will always be as sensible as myself "'of the great honour you have done my family. "'An alliance with so charming and so excellent a young lady "'would indeed be an honour to the greatest in England.' "'Yes,' cries Western, "'but if I had suffered her to stand shill I shall at dilly-dally, "'you might not have had that honour yet a while.' i was forced to use a little fatherly authority to bring her to i hope not cries allworthy i hope there is not the least constraint why there cries western you may bid her unsay all again if you will dost repent heartily of thy promise dost not sophia indeed papa cries she i do not repent nor do i believe i ever shall of any promise in favour of mr jones then, nephew, cries Allworthy, I felicitate you most heartily, for I think you are the happiest of men. And, madam, you will give me leave to congratulate you on this joyful occasion? Indeed, I am convinced you have bestowed yourself on one who will be sensible of your great merit, and who will at least use his best endeavours to deserve it. "'His best endeavours!' cries Western. "'That he will, I warrant, and hark ye, Allworthy, "'I'll bet thee five pounds to a crown "'we have a boy to-morrow nine months. "'But, prithee, tell me what would ha, "'would ha burgundy, champagne, or what? "'For please Jupiter, we will make a night on it.' "'Indeed, sir,' said Allworthy, "'you must excuse me. "'Both my nephew and I were engaged "'before I suspected this near approach of his happiness.' "'Engaged,' quoth the squire, "'never tell me I won't part with thee to-night "'upon any occasion. "'Shalt sup here, please the Lord Harry.' "'You must pardon me, my dear neighbour,' answered Allworthy. "'I have given a solemn promise, "'and that you know I never break.' "'Why, prithee, who art engaged to?' cries the squire. Allworthy then informed him, as likewise, of the company. "'Od zookers,' answered the squire, "'I will go with thee, and so shall Sophie, "'for I won't part with thee to-night, "'and it would be barbarous to part Tom and the girl.' This offer was presently embraced by Allworthy, and Sophia consented, having first obtained a private promise from her father, that he would not mention a syllable concerning her marriage. End of chapter 12 Book 18, chapter 13 In which the history is concluded young nightingale had been that afternoon by appointment to wait on his father who received him much more kindly than he expected there likewise he met his uncle whose return to town in quest of his new married daughter this marriage was the luckiest incident which could have happened to the young gentleman for these brothers lived in a constant state of contention about the government of their children both heartily despising the method which each other took each of them therefore now endeavoured as much as he could to palliate the offence which his own child committed and to aggravate the match of the other 
This desire of triumphing over his brother, added to the many arguments which Allworthy had used, so strongly operated on the old gentleman, that he met his son with a smiling countenance, and actually agreed to sup with him that evening at Mrs. Miller's. As for the other, who really loved his daughter with the most immoderate affection, there was little difficulty in inclining him to a reconciliation. He was no sooner informed by his nephew where his daughter and her husband were, than he declared he would instantly go to her. And when he arrived there he scarce suffered her to fall upon her knees before he took her up and embraced her with a tenderness which affected all who saw him and in less than a quarter of an hour was as well reconciled to both her and her husband as if he had himself joined their hands. In this situation were affairs when Mr. Allworthy and his company arrived to complete the happiness of Mrs. Miller, who no sooner saw Sophia than she guessed everything that had happened, and so great was her friendship to Jones that it added not a few transports to those she felt on the happiness of her own daughter. There have not, I believe, been many instances of a number of people met together where every one was so perfectly happy as in this company, amongst whom the father of young Nightingale enjoyed the least perfect content, for, notwithstanding his affection for his son, notwithstanding the authority and the arguments of Allworthy, together with the other motive mentioned before, he could not so entirely be satisfied with his son's choice, and perhaps the presence of Sophia herself tended a little to aggravate and heighten his concern as a thought now and then suggested itself that his son might have had that lady, or some other such. Not that any of the charms which adorned either the person or mind of Sophia created the uneasiness. It was the contents of her father's coffers which set his heart a-longing. These were the charms which he could not bear to think his son had sacrificed to the daughter of Mrs. Miller. The brides were both very pretty women, but so totally were they eclipsed by the beauty of Sophia, that had they not been two of the best-tempered girls in the world, it would have raised some envy in their breasts, for neither of their husbands could long keep his eyes from Sophia who sat at the table like a queen receiving homage, or rather like a superior being receiving adoration from all around her. But it was an adoration which they gave, not which she exacted, for she was as much distinguished by her modesty and affability as by all her other perfections. The evening was spent in much true mirth. All were happy, but those the most, who had been the most unhappy before. Their former sufferings and fears gave such a relish to their felicity as even love and fortune, in their fullest flow, could not have given without the advantage of such a comparison. Yet, as great joy, especially after a sudden change and revolution of circumstances, is apt to be silent, and dwells rather in the heart than on the tongue, Jones and Sophia appeared the least merry of the company, which Western observed with great impatience, often crying out to them, Why dost not talk, boy? Why dost look so grave? Hast lost thy tongue, girl? Drink another glass of wine, shut out another glass! and, the more to enliven her, he would sometimes sing a merry song, which bore some relation to matrimony and the loss of a maidenhead. Nay, he would have proceeded so far on that topic as to have driven her out of the room, if Mr. Allworthy had not checked him, sometimes by looks, and once or twice by a fie, Mr. Western. He began, indeed, once to debate the matter, and assert his right to talk to his own daughter as he thought fit, but as nobody seconded him, he was soon reduced to order. Notwithstanding this little restraint, he was so pleased with the cheerfulness and good humour of the company, that he insisted on their meeting the next day at his lodgings. 
They all did so, and the lovely Sophia, who was now in private become a bride too, officiated as the mistress of ceremonies, or, in the polite phrase, did the honours of the table. She had that morning given her hand to Jones in the chapel at Doctor's Common, where Mr. Allworthy, Mr. Western, and Mrs. Miller were the only persons present. Sophia had earnestly desired her father that no others of the company who were that day to dine with him should be acquainted with her marriage. The same secrecy was enjoined to Mrs. Miller, and Jones undertook for Allworthy. This somewhat reconciled the delicacy of Sophia to the public entertainment, which, in compliance with father's will, she was obliged to go to greatly against her inclinations. In confidence of this secrecy, she went through the day pretty well, till the squire, who was now advanced into the second bottle, could contain his joy no longer, but filling out a bumper, drank a health to the bride. The health was immediately pledged by all present, to the great confusion of our poor blushing Sophia, and the great concern of Jones upon her account. To say truth, there was not a person present made wiser by this discovery, for Mrs. Miller had whispered it to her daughter, her daughter to her husband, her husband to his sister, and she to all the rest. Sophia now took the first opportunity of withdrawing with the ladies, and the squire sat into his caps, in which he was by degrees deserted by all the company, except the uncle of young Nightingale, who loved his bottle as well as Western himself. These two, therefore, sat stoutly to it during the whole evening, and long after that happy hour which had surrendered the charming Sophia to the eager arms of her enraptured Jones. Thus, reader, we have at length brought our history to a conclusion, in which, to our great pleasure, though contrary perhaps to thy expectation, Mr. Jones appears to be the happiest of all humankind. For what happiness this world affords equal to the possession of such a woman as Sophia, I sincerely own I have never yet discovered. As to the other persons who have made any considerable figure in this history, as some may desire to know a little more concerning them, we will proceed in as few words as possible to satisfy their curiosity. Allworthy hath never yet been prevailed upon to see Bliffle, but he hath yielded to the importunity of Jones, backed by Sophia, to settle two hundred pound a year upon him to which Jones hath privately added a third. Upon this income he lives in one of the northern counties, about two hundred miles distant from London, and lays up two hundred pound a year out of it, in order to purchase a seat in the next Parliament from a neighbouring borough, which he has bargained for with an attorney there. He is also lately turned Methodist, in hopes of marrying a very rich widow of that sect, whose estate lies in that part of the kingdom. Square died soon after he writ the before-mentioned letter, and as to Thwackham he continues at his vicarage. He hath made many fruitless attempts to regain the confidence of Allworthy, or to ingratiate himself with Jones, both of whom he flatters to their faces, and abuses behind their backs. But in his stead Mr. Allworthy hath lately taken Mr. Abraham Adams into his house, of whom Sophia is grown immoderately fond, and declares he shall have the tuition of her children. Mrs. Fitzpatrick is separated from her husband, and retains the little remains of her fortune. She lives in reputation at the polite end of the town, and is so good an economist that she spends three times the income of her fortune without running into debt. She maintains a perfect intimacy with the lady of the Irish peer, and in acts of friendship to her repays all obligations she owes her husband. Mrs. Western was soon reconciled to her niece Sophia, and hath spent two months together with her in the country. Lady Bellaston made the latter a formal visit at her return to town, where she behaved to Jones as a perfect stranger, and with great civility wished him joy on his marriage. 
Mr. Nightingale hath purchased an estate for his son in the neighbourhood of Jones, where the young gentleman, his lady, Mrs. Miller, and her little daughter reside, and the most agreeable intercourse subsists between the two families. As to those of lower account, Mrs. Waters, returned into the country, had a pension of sixty pound a year settled upon her by Mr. Allworthy, and is married to Parson Supple on whom at the instance of sophia western hath bestowed a considerable living black george hearing the discovery that had been made ran away and was never since heard of and jones bestowed the money on his family but not in equal proportions for molly had much the greatest share as for Partridge, Jones hath settled fifty pound a year on him, and he hath again set up a school, in which he meets with much better encouragement than formerly. And there is now a treaty of marriage on foot between him and Miss Molly Seagram, which, through the mediation of Sophia, is likely to take effect. We now return to take leave of Mr. Jones and Sophia, who within two days after their marriage attended Mr. Western and Mr. Allworthy into the country. Western hath resigned his family seat, and the greater part of his estate, to his son-in-law, and hath retired to a lesser house of his in another part of the country, which is better for hunting. Indeed, he is often as a visitant with Mr. Jones, who, as well as his daughter, hath an infinite delight in doing everything in their power to please him, and this desire of theirs is attended with such success that the old gentleman declares he was never happy in his life till now he hath there a parlour and an antechamber to himself where he gets drunk with whom he pleases and his daughter is still as ready as formerly to play to him whenever he desires it for jones hath assured her that as next to pleasing her one of his highest satisfactions is to contribute to the happiness of the old man so the great duty which she expresses and performs to her father renders her almost equally dear to him with the love which she bestows on himself sophia hath already produced him two fine children a boy and a girl of whom the old gentleman is so fond that he spends much of his time in the nursery where he declares the tattling of his little granddaughter who is above a year and a half old is sweeter music than the finest cry of dogs in england allworthy was likewise greatly liberal to jones on the marriage and hath omitted no instance of showing his affection to him and his lady who love him as a father Whatever in the nature of Jones had a tendency to vice, has been corrected by continual conversation with this good man, and by his union with the lovely and virtuous Sophia. He hath also, by reflection on his past follies, acquired a discretion and prudence very uncommon in one of his lively parts. To conclude, as there are not to be found a worthier man and woman than this fond couple, so neither can any be imagined more happy. They preserve the purest and tenderest affection for each other, an affection daily increased and confirmed by mutual endearments and mutual esteem. Nor is their conduct towards their relations and friends less amiable than towards one another, and such is their condescension, their indulgence, and their beneficence to those below them, that there is not a neighbour, a tenant, or a servant, who doth not most gratefully bless the day when Mr. Jones was married to his Sophia. End of chapter 13 End of The History of Tom Jones, a Foundling, by Henry Fielding Recorded by Maureen Blasky of babasbeach.ca in Victoria, November 12, 2008.